So now we're talking about ionization. Looks like a similar definition, but you're definitely going to be assessed, tested on, can you correctly identify? Dissociation, previous, was ionic compounds, the separating of charges, of ions. Now we're doing the formation of ions, in particular from a molecule. Okay. So the, the starting point in your brain to separate these are molecules might ionize. Emphasis on the might. Okay. Ionic compounds will dissociate always a little bit in solution. May not dissociate very much, but they'll always dissociate a little bit. And your solubility table would tell us previously if it's going to be a lot or a little. Okay. But I'm always writing it assume something dissociates a little bit. Okay. So I have ethanoic acid. What's on the board is basically vinegar, CH3COOH. You could buy as vinegar, has that distinctive smell. It has no charge. But when you put vinegar into water. Notice I put a liquid. Ethanoic acid is a liquid. You put it in water. That doesn't show up as a reactant. And we're going to make some ions. We are going to form H plus. Okay. And then everything else that's left over, CH3, our second C, the two O's, will have an extra electron because the H came off positive and that will come off negative. We have made ions. There were some shared bonds that were broken. Okay. Now the last chemical, that anion, is called acetate and it's in your data booklet. If you ever see the word acetate in a question, it's this guy, and you can always just look it up first. I think it's the first alphabetic in your table. Something else that will ionize is HF. You put HF into solution. That H was not an ion to begin with. We have two non-metals that are going to share electrons. But you put it in water, and the fluoride takes all the shared electrons and becomes negative, and the H plus doesn't get any and becomes positive. Okay. So that's ionization. You're going to have to be told when something could possibly ionize. And you're going to get a little detail how to know on the next slide. Okay. So now we have our building blocks. We can understand Arrhenius acids and bases. So there are many definitions of acids and bases. We're going to use um, our Henius definition here. In Chem 30, we're going to use Bronson Lowry's definition. So you have to be a bit fluid uh, with your acids and bases. In university, you might move on and learn about Lewis's definition of acids and bases. So acids are substances that produce H plus in solution. So not just a hydrogen. If it came off elementally, it'd be a gas and would bubble. And we just saw that in the previous slide. Some molecules will ionize. The ones that will ionize are the acids. So there's lots of ways we could tell you something is an acid. We could tell you the pH is low. We could tell you what happened to litmus paper. Or I could just say blank is an acid, write it ionization or dissociation equation. You tell me which one. And you go, oh, that's acids are for molecules. They're going to ionize. Okay. We never dissociate H plus. Okay. 
because we need a cation, a metal cation to get that happening. Okay? And you're not going to see that with, with hydrogen. So hydrogen chloride makes an acidic solution. You put hydrogen chloride gas into water you get that H plus ion and Cl minus ion. And it turns out you can only put 12 moles of hydrogen chloride into a liter of water. You can't get more than 12 moles per liter. But that's a lot, 12 moles per liter uh, of acid. I'm going to put a similar one to This is a three carbon long carboxylic acid. You just saw a two carbon long vinegar on the previous slide. Okay. I'm putting a second one of these up because I want you to get used to that COOH. Okay. H is connected to carbons don't come off. They're bonded too strongly. You have to combust or burn the material to get that hydrogen off and you get water. But when you have that H at the end of an oxygen combination, this H can ionize. None of the others can ionize with the end of that COOH. And you have a data booklet with a whole bunch of acids and bases in it. And you always have this in Chem 20. In Chem 30, it's a good resource. And there's all kinds of those COOHs. And in Chem 30, you'll learn how to name them. You'll learn about properties. Uh, carboxylic acid is what they'll call them next year. And I want you to get used to that name, carboxylic acid, this year. Okay. So carboxylic acids can ionize. And then everything else is left over. And in the bonding part of this course, we'll talk about exactly how does the C and the two O's work? What's their th arrangement or three-dimensional structure? We just haven't gotten there yet. So in my first two examples, and every single example I would ever do of something ionizing, we're going to get H plus. And that's why litmus can work on every single acid or base. Because every acid produces H plus. You, you have a, we have a chemical that will litmus. So those H plus, there, what turns, let's see, we're talking about the acid, so it turns blue litmus red. So it doesn't matter the acid, you're going to get H plus. So it's going to cause that list misses to switch as long as you have enough. If you dumped in a very tiny amount of acid and the pH was like just below 7, 6.9, it's actually not enough to change the litmus. But any reasonable concentration of any acid and the litmus is going to work. Okay. So that's our acids. Okay. As a category, they're going to ionize. No dissociation here. We learned about dissociation to help us understand our basis. Bases are substances that produce hydroxide ions. So acids, very important, you know, acids produce hydrogen ion in solution, bases produce hydroxide ion. Every 
Arrhenius base produces hydroxide ions. Now, all of your strong bases are going to fit in two categories. Okay. Now, I said strong. There are some weak ones we'll deal with later that won't fit into this pattern. But all your strong bases are going to be either a group one metal with hydroxide, and it just dissociates and comes apart, or it's going to be a group two metal with hydroxide that dissociates okay, and comes apart. So I'm going to do an example that kind of fits into each of these categories. So a group one metal, like lithium, okay, paired up with hydroxide, would be a strong acid, strong base, sorry. Okay. You put lithium hydroxide in water. The lithium ion separates from the hydroxide ion. And there's our hydroxide that's going to affect red litmus. Okay. You might have a group two metal like magnesium, and the group two metals need two hydroxides in its formula unit. You put that into water, the ratio is a little different, but you still get hydroxide. And it's a hydroxide that turns red litmus blue. together. Okay. So all acids are going to produce H plus in solution by ionization. All bases are going to produce hydroxide ion through a dissociation. So what is an acid base reaction? So an example, not an acid base reaction, but an acid and a base, what they're going to do, so the H plus sorry, the uh, HCl is going to make H plus and something else. The base will make a ion and hydroxide. Now, both of these are strong species, and any time you have a strong acid with a strong base, the H plus is going to combine with the hydroxide, and that's where you get water. And the other pairing is you're going to get a salt from the, two, the part of the acid that does nothing. Chloride doesn't do anything. It's not bad for you. It's in inner oceans. Sodium ions by themselves aren't bad. The Na and the Cl combine and you get a salt. So I'm going to write that as a chemical reaction. So HCl plus NaOH, that's our acid in our base. When we write the acid in the base, we don't see the dissociation, the ionization. You can just use a double replacement to predict it, but you lose a lot of chemistry or understanding when you just do your double replacement. Okay, so the H is going to pair up with the OH. That would give us our water, and the sodium is going to pair up with the chloride. Okay. Okay. But it really happened in two steps. Dissociation, ionization, made some ions, then they reacted. So the red arrow is the H and the OH, which would make water, and the sodium from the base and the chloride from the acid pair up. So in my state, you're always going to get liquid water. Sodium chloride is highly soluble. Okay. 
Now, there's a few ways. You, you could see sodium hydroxide be poured in as a solid into solution. That would work. Okay. So you have a powder, sodium hydroxide, you pour that into your water. Or in the lab, often this has already been made up as a solution. So don't get too confused if you see NACA, NACL solid in a reaction or NACL aqueous. Are you talking about the solid before you dumped it in the water or after you dumped it in the water? Okay. Solid is before you dumped it in, uh, aqueous is after. Okay. Now, we can't buy HCl gas, or we could, but it's hard to deal with. We always have HCl pre-made as an aqueous solution. Okay. But you could, somebody, not us, took the gas, put it in water, and did the ionization and made up hydrochloric acid. We would probably buy a bottle of 12 mole per liter and then dilute it down to what we want. Okay. So that's our acid and base. So that's the main part of this lesson. I just want to end with a little bit of a visual. Solutions can be really complicated. There's a lot of possibilities. So I want to do a visual of kind of all the possibilities and then highlight where we're going to focus. So aqueous solution by solute type. Again, this is going to seem confusing, and then I'm going to summar or simplify it down to what we're going to study. Okay. Your solute could be ionic. An ionic compound, so sodium chloride, silver chloride, calcium nitride. And we're largely talking about ionic compounds, when you put them in solution, are going to be aqueous, that are going to dissolve, that are going to be conductive. There are ionic compounds, you put them in solution, and they're not uh, going to dissociate. They're not very soluble. In the Alberta book, it's page six that lets you do soluble or not. We're really focusing on the first arrow, writing dissociation equations for things that are going to break up. Okay? If you put something in solution and it doesn't break up, it stays as a solid, this would be non-conductive. So you put a solid into solution and it looks like a snow globe because it didn't break up, it didn't dissolve and dissociate. Okay. Now within our ionic compounds, we're going to focus on the ones that do break up, that are conductive. Okay. We can write dissociation equations to explain it. We're going to have to watch out that some of these might be a base. If we write the dissociation and we get hydroxide, this is going to be an Arrhenius base. Okay. Most of the dissociations are in acids or bases because there's no H plus, there's no OH minus. And again, this is kind of what we're focusing on right now in our solutions unit. Because okay. the other pathway, I'll put a that would make a heterogeneous solution and none of our math is going to work. You know, we can't do solute, solvent, or, or amount concentration math with that. Okay. Now, you might put a molecule in water. Our, our, our solute might be something without any ions. Now, you might put something, a molecule, into water that does break up, that makes an aqueous solution. Okay. We haven't really talked about this very much. An example would be sugar. You put C6H12O6 into water, into your coffee, and the sugar molecules come apart. Okay. But they don't ionize. Okay. 
all the sugar molecules do is separate from each other. And that would be a non-conductive solution. The conductivity meter light uh, would not turn on. We're going to spend our time on those very few molecules that are acids that ionize. So I just we get biased. I spend I do so many examples of molecules ionizing. You incorrectly think, oh, they all ionize. Okay, but it's very rare for them to ionize. I can put any amount of sugar in my coffee, and I'm never going to change the pH. I'm going to make it taste really sweet and bad. It might be unhealthy for me, but not because there's an acid. So we're there. Okay. One other branch, we'll deal with this a lot when we get into bonding. We could put a molecule in that's nonpolar. There's no positive or negative end to it. Okay? We haven't learned why, but I said water has a positive end and a negative end. If you put something nonpolar into water, you're going to get two layers. This is your oil and water. You put oil into water, you can't do any of the math we're doing. You can't do amount concentrations because they're not going to mix. Okay? The oil will not act as a solute and be broken up by the solvent water. So in the bonding unit, we will come back here. Last, and just because I give a couple practice problems, okay. you may drop a metal into water. We're not going to study this very much, but again, in my homework, it'll show up a few times. Okay. Most metals are not reactive with water. And you're just going to get a heterogeneous solution. You're going to get two layers. The metal is just going to fall to the bottom. If I don't mention it, you're not sure how to deal with that question. Now, we've seen an example of when they do react, the group one metals and the group two metals are very reactive. And we did a gas stoic lab. We put calcium into water, which is group two, and it did a nice double replace, single replacement right away. But most metals, you put a penny into water or a nickel or a quarter, most metals don't really react. So there's a lot of things you can put into solution. You can put ionic compounds, you can put molecules, you can put metals. There's certainly a few things missing. I'm just going to restart the bottom. We're focusing here and there right now. With a little bit, we could, if I told you I put 10 grams in a liter, 10 grams of sugar in a total volume of three liters, you could do the math with the sugar, but that's it. You could tell me moles per liter. So that's where we're sort of nicely into the start of this unit. Okay. We can do a bit of math, amount concentration. We know ionization dissociation, Arrhenius acids, uh, Arrhenius basis.